In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to speak to you about a particular place that we all know well. This all too familiar place can be difficult to acknowledge. For it is, at least for me, a place of some of my greatest disappointments, humiliation, and shame. Yet, it is also where I have grown the most as a person and have had the most palpable, life-transforming experiences of God. Now, if you had been standing next to me at the time of those experiences, I'm not sure you would have known it. But that, to my mind, is just another part of the great mystery of grace. You know the place of which I speak because you have been there too. In fact, a part of you is there right now, as is a part of me. This is the space in between, the gap, which sometimes feels like a chasm between the person we would like to be surely the person we want others to believe us to be and who we are. It's the space in between our self-perceptions and reality, our aspirations and our actions, between our professed values and how we behave. In religious terms, this is the space in between the words we pray in a church like this one and how we live when we walk out the door, the space in between the person we imagine God is calling us to be and the one we encounter every time we look in the mirror. There are many ways we can occupy this space. Some are healthy and some are not. Our immediate response whenever we find ourselves there or realize that we're there depends a lot on how we were treated in our first and most formative experiences of this particularly excruciating internal dissonance and publicly exposed contradictions. I'll tell you one of mine. When I was in junior high, I wanted nothing more than to belong to a particular group of friends a group, unfortunately, that wanted nothing to do with me. I totally missed all the signs that they were clearly sending every social cue in the highly structured social strata of early adolescent girls. And so I persisted in effort after futile effort to make my way in among them. I was close enough in proximity to convince myself that we were, in fact, friends. But one horrible day, two girls made it crystal clear that I was not one of them and never would be. And I felt exposed, embarrassed, and ashamed. I think I went numb for a long time because, frankly, The rest of junior high is a blissful blur in my memory. But from that point on, I learned how to read social cues like nobody's business. And I learned slowly, painstakingly, how to fit in. Becoming a chameleon, actually, able to adjust and blend in into just about any situation or social group I found myself in, and internally panicking whenever I failed. So I have spent a lot of time in my life on what Bill Hybels aptly aptly names, get this, image management. But were Dr. Brene Brown, who was scheduled to be in this pulpit this morning, would she be here? Surely she would have said, fitting in is a hollow substitute for belonging. Fitting in requires you to change who you are, while true belonging requires you 
to be who you are. So here's the grace part. The encounters with God that have come to me in these, this particular corner of my in-between place, there have actually been times when it has occurred to me that fitting into a group that I either aspired to or actually found myself in wasn't worth it. A part of me so fundamental wasn't given space there that I didn't want to be there. And even more transformative, I heard God call me in my, in my meanness, my, my Marianne-ness, saying, this is who you are. And I learned something that, again, Brene Brown says so beautifully in the book that you simply must read, braving the wilderness the quest for true belonging, that belonging isn't something that we negotiate with one another externally. Belonging is something we carry within us when we know who we are. Another path to the in-between place takes us through the terrain of suffering that we cause, the hurt we inflict on other people. And sometimes we hurt people intentionally and often unconsciously. And again, how we respond when we realize that we're standing in that gap, the space between our professed love for another and how we have just spoken to them, for example, depends on our first conscious awareness of that stunning realization that we can be that kind of person or how we've watched others important to us navigate the same terrain. Defensiveness is our most predictable first response once denial no longer serves us and we rush in with all of our explanations and rationalizations and excuses and again, anger is not uncommon, enabling us to strike back at the very person, pointing out our contradictions. I mean, have you ever said to someone, thank you, darling, for pointing that out to me? I have not ever said that once. Depending on how long we've lived behind the edifice of our blind spots, once the reality sinks in, we might actually collapse under a time, for a time, under the weight of the stunning realization that we are capable of such behavior. And this is where addictions and distractions are really helpful because they can veer us off on endless paths of self-destruction. But again, this painful in-between place can be the very soil of our greatest growth and spiritual transformation when we come face to face with who we are and we allow God in. Now, on a personal level, there is no more compelling description of this saving grace than what is commonly known in our culture as 12-step spirituality, as it has come to us through Alcoholics Anonymous and other recovery movements. And I'll summarize quickly the 12 steps for you. The first three are when we acknowledge our powerlessness over our addiction or behavior, and we turn to God, however we understand God, knowing that we cannot save ourselves from ourselves, and so we turn our lives over to God. And we'd like to stop there, frankly. I've spent a lot of my time in those first three steps thinking I'm doing my work. But then there are steps four through nine, which involve moral inventories and accountability, acknowledging all the ways that we have hurt other people, confessing our faults to a trusted person, and then going back and making amends where possible where, with every person we have hurt. 
and then steps 10 through 12, which is basically going back to step one, working our way through nine, and making that a way of life, acknowledging our faults, offering ourselves to God for healing grace, and taking responsibility for our actions. On a societal level, this process of acknowledging and coming to terms with collective harm done on our behalf by our people, whoever our people are, the wars that have been fought in our name, systemic racism and white privilege, environmental degradation to name only three, how, how we respond there, that's, that's more complicated. Because if, if we are among those who have benefited from whatever seems to be those invisible forces that we had no control over, we personally did not create, we are able in our imaginations to hide forever behind a kind of learned helplessness and simply choosing not to think about such hard things, which is a sign of privilege, you know, when you can simply choose to stop thinking about something that is causing such harm to other people. Or just as unhelpful, we can wallow in a diffuse sense of guilt that leads us nowhere. But here again, in this most uncomfortable, challenging place, through the grace of God, our species has taken some of its greatest leaps forward when a few of us decided that no matter how we got here and who is at fault, we are going to make a difference. As Abraham, Joshua Abraham Heschel said, some are guilty, but all of us are responsible. And if we listen to the biblical prophets, we hear this endless cry of God, I know you're waiting for me, he seems to be saying, but I am also waiting for you to do your part to help me make this world the world I long for it to be. And when we do that, amazing things happen and we are part of the transformation and the renewal of the world. Okay, one more. I'll wrap this up, bring the sermon home, and this is the final corner of the in-between terrain I will mention today, and it harkens back, I think, to what Jesus was trying to get at in his um, argument with the Pharisees. And um, I don't know if you're noticing, but in these stories, Jesus is losing patience with the religious authorities. He's, um, he's getting closer and closer to his crucifixion. He's just thrown the money changers out of the temple and he's looking at religious hypocrisy. He's looking at people who have set themselves up against other people thinking that they're better. And he says to them, you know, the only way you can do that is if you're not paying attention to yourself. Right? The only way you can pray a prayer like, I thank you, God, that I'm not like those other people, is if you're not looking in word at yourself. That's why the tax collectors and the prostitutes are ahead of you, because they know what you refuse to see. And so in this third terrain, my friends, we can lay down the weight of our aloneness born of an undue sense of perfectionism, that we're supposed to be perfect, that we in fact don't belong in that in-between space when it is our home. It's where we live with everybody else, all of us striving to be more of who God created us to be and coming face to face every day with the ways that we fail. And isn't it a relief when we can simply acknowledge that to one another and look at one another as mutual, mutual recipients of grace and worthy of one another's kindness and compassion. And when we do that, 
We are intrinsically bound to one another as children of the same God, equally deserving of grace, equally capable of offering it through our imperfections. And when we do that, the kingdom of God gets another beachhead in our world. But remember, we will walk into that kingdom of God together, or we won't get there at all. So do your small part. Do your part to look at one another, look at yourself with compassion, receive the grace that belongs to you, and ask yourself if this might be the day when God needs you to do something brave, something good, so that the kingdom of God might inch closer toward us all. Will you pray with me? Lord, here we are in that in-between space that you know so well. And we thank you that Jesus emptied himself of all that was his in your kingdom to come and be among us, to assure us of your love for us, your forgiveness and your mercy. And we need that mercy, Lord, each and every one of us. And in this space, Lord, we offer ourselves to you to, to do whatever you would have us do through our imperfections and failings to create your kingdom here on earth. So thank you for those inspired ones who have gone before. Thank you for our wounds that help us to be compassionate. Thank you for our brothers and sisters with whom we can lock arms and embrace in kindness and in service um, to, the one, to the one God who loves and saves us all. And in your name we pray. Amen.